hope this is working. <laughs> Give me a hot second. Yay! Okay, I think this is working. Um, obviously, there's the YouTube delay. Please tell me if you can't hear me or if my stream cuts out or anything, but I'm just going to assume everything is working. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, I haven't streamed in a minute, and that means I just completely forgot how to do it. <laughs> so that's on me. Uh, give me a minute. I'm just going to post on social so people know that this is live, and then we will be off to the races. I hope everyone is having a wonderful evening. Um, so I don't know how many of you have read the post that I put out yesterday. Um, but I covered this a little bit yesterday in my newsletter, citationneeded.news. Um, go check it out if you haven't already. Uh, and if you read that, you have some idea, I think, of how the sentencing will probably go tomorrow. Um, but I will go over it just briefly for those of you who haven't read it. Um, and then I wanted to just go into a little bit more detail around how the process works, um, the arguments that each side is sort of trying to present tomorrow in front of Judge Kaplan, um, and then, you know, the sort of process and likely potentially likely outcome. Um, so I'm going to say right now, I have the documents here in front of me, but I'm having some technical difficulties there too. So I'm going to have to sort of go back and forth between computers to pull anything up. Um, but hopefully it will be reasonable to do that. Um, okay. So to sort of go over this, um, so Sam Bingman fried uh, was convicted in November, early November of last year, of seven felony charges. Um, basically, unanimous jury found him guilty on all charges that were being considered in that case um, within a very short period of time. It was like very quickly after they began deliberating. Um, and so since then, he has been waiting in jail uh, for sentencing, which has always been scheduled for now. Um, there tends to be kind of a long delay between um, conviction and sentencing. Uh, this is honestly not even that long compared to some uh, convicted, you know, uh, people who are waiting for sentencing. Um, but he's, he's sort of had to wait, which I imagine is very unpleasant as someone who is, um, you know, staring down the barrel of potentially a really long sentence. So, um, the way that sentencing works, and I will caveat this, I'm not a lawyer, I don't have a legal background, I am sort of learning things as I go as I watch this case, uh, so I don't, obviously none of this is legal advice or anything like that, and I apologize if I make any errors, please correct me. Um, but the way that sentencing generally works is that the probation department prepares what's called a pre-sentence report, which is an incredibly thorough document that goes over basically Sam Beckman frieds whole history from like childhood, like education, his upbringing, his financial circumstances, um, his mental health. I mean, it goes like it's like this incredibly deep dive into his um, personal life, his professional life, and then, of course, into the alleged crime and, you know, everything that happened around that. Um, so it's this big document that they prepare. And based on that, they come up with a number um, that is uh, supposed to represent his offense level. And that number uh, is sort of plugged into a chart. And the chart on one side, I could probably pull it up at some point. Uh, on one side, it has, you know, the offense level. And then across the top, it has the criminal offense level of the defendant. Um, and that represents basically their criminal background. And it goes from someone who has no criminal history all the way to, you know, someone who is basically like a lifelong offender. Um, and then, you know, in the chart, it shows the recommended number of months that the person would serve in prison based on those two factors. And so Sam Bankman frieds offense level based on um, the pre-sentence report was 56. The chart 
maxes out at 43. <laughs> so for the purposes of sentencing, he is a level 43 offender. But he is basically off the charts as far as the uh, recommended or the offense level goes. Now, people will disagree on the offense level. And so the... Um, Government has submitted a sentencing memo, and this is, you know, this is the prosecutors in the case have submitted this memo, arguing that his actual offense level should be 60, which is a little bit higher than 56, but either way doesn't really matter because 43 is like the highest you can get. Um, the defense, Sam Bankman fried has submitted a sentencing memo saying that he believes the offense level is, I actually don't remember off the top of my head, I could look, um, but it's low <laughs> and would basically, um, it basically removes the entire sentencing enhancement for the amount of loss, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, long story short, based on these calculations, the pre-sentencing report suggests that Bankman Freed should get a sentence of 100 years, which is less than the maximum sentence for this charge. Um, so... A 43, a level 43 offense would give a life in prison, you know, a life sentence in prison, even for people who have never offended before, like Bankman Freed. Um, but the maximum sentence for this fraud offense is 110 years, which is considered to be less than life, which is very weird because, like, I don't think any adult is going to survive a 110 year prison sentence, but for whatever reason, they call that less than the life sentence. Um, either way, um, the pre-sentence report ultimately recommended not that maximum 110-year sentence, but a 100-year sentence, which is a 10-year uh, departure downwards from that maximum sentence. And the pre-sentence report is not public, so I don't know why that is. Um, but they, the both sides reference it very heavily in their sentencing memos. And so that's how I know sort of what those calculations were. Um, but like I said, I can't really tell you why they said, oh, 10 years down. Now, again, this is all really academic because unless Bankman Freed lives to be 132 years old, the difference between a 100 year sentence and a 110 year sentence is pretty much moot. Um, but that's what this, that's what the report says. And as far as I understand it, the pre-sentence reports are, they just sort of go based off the calculation. They don't do the type of like, well, this seems fair type of, you know, arguing that the prosecutors and the defense and ultimately the judge will do. So it's just like a calculation. So the government came in, saw the pre-sentence report, and they basically agreed with the calculations. They actually argued for a couple more enhancements that would bring his offense level up, but ultimately decided that they feel like a 40 to 50 year sentence is justified. Um, and that is based on a few things. Um, namely, they, they feel like they want such a long sentence because they're concerned he would reoffend. They want a shorter sentence than 110 years because they want to sort of give him a chance to have some life after prison, even if he is fairly old at that point. Um, so they, they sort of settled on this middle number of 40 to 50 years, which they say, you know, satisfies the different, um, you know, goals of sentencing, which is to prevent him from reoffending, provide a deterrent effect for any future offenders, um, you know, and obviously deter him from committing a crime again. So um, that's the argument from the government side. And then the argument from the defense is basically that Bankman Freed should do um, five and a half, no, five and a quarter to six and a half years in prison based on the argument that there was no loss. Um, there was no monetary loss and that there were no, therefore there were no victims, um, which would pull the uh, calculated offense level like way, way down uh, and could potentially, you know, result in a sentence of that length. Um, they spend most of their sentencing memo going into that argument, which is, I think, a really challenging argument. And we can talk about it a little bit. Um, 
but uh, they, yeah, they're trying to say that like, okay, so, you know, at some point, you know, there were $8 billion missing, $10 billion missing even, but because, um, you know, because the money is being uh, recovered by the bankruptcy team and will be returned to the creditors, there was zero loss. And actually, Bankman Freed in the sentencing memo continues to make the arguments that he's made ever since the FTX collapse, which is that FTX is solvent, uh, both FTX US and FTX International. He argues that both of them were solvent as the time of as of the time of bankruptcy. And if they had not gone bankrupt, everything would have been fine. <laughs> Like he basically says, he's arguing again that like it was a liquidity problem. Some of the assets were in um, illiquid investments. And so, you know, we couldn't immediately meet withdrawals, but had we liquidated our assets over a period of, you know, days, weeks, months, we would have had the money to pay everyone back. And it's just this pesky bankruptcy that ruined everything. Um, That's a bold argument to be making. <laughs> Uh, because at trial, that was pretty much very convincingly shown to not be true. Um, that the they did not have the assets they needed, that many of them had been spent on things that you can't just liquidate. You know, if you pay for a Super Bowl commercial, you can't be like, oh, wait, I need that money back. You know, that's not an illiquid asset. That's something you've paid for. Um you know, and the same is true of some of their investments, which had terms that, you know, basically a lot of the the assets that have been clawed back were only clawed back because of the bankruptcy. Um, and so, you know, it's a tough argument to be making, but he's trying for it. So, you know, good luck to him. Um, it's made tougher by the fact that the bankruptcy, um, the, the CEO in bankruptcy, John J. Ray III, submitted his own victim impact statement, um, basically saying that everything Bankman Freed said about the bankruptcy is false. And that's, I think, a little tough for Bankman Freed because he is basically quoting John J. Ray III when he says everyone's going to get 100% of their assets back. Um, and John J. Ray III is writing a letter to say, well, that's not really what I said. You know, there are all these caveats there. Um, there's absolutely a chance that people won't get 100% of their assets back, even based on the way they're defining 100% of assets, which, again, I can go into in a minute. Um, you know, basically, if a certain, you know, if some things don't go the way that the bankruptcy team is hoping, it's possible that they won't get that 100% recovery. Um, and then he basically says, you know, it was despite Bankman Freed's best efforts that we were able to recover any of this money at all not because of his efforts. Um, so, you know, I think I think there's going to be a l uphill battle around the argument that uh, there were zero losses and zero victims, um, especially because I think at least 100, I haven't counted exactly, but there are like 100 victim impact statements submitted by FTX customers that go into absolutely like heart-wrenching detail about people whose assets were... Um, you know, they unavailable to them for this period of time. You know, it's coming up on what's it been a year and a half now, I think, um, that people had assets in FTX that they assumed, you know, were would be reasonably available if they wanted to get access to them. And now they've been unable to get that access and in some cases have had to, you know, take out loans or make changes to their financial plans or, you know, put off buying a house or getting married. You know, there are all these stories in there about the ways that people have suffered financially and then also the ways that people have suffered mentally. I mean, there, there are people who talk about being suicidal or, um, you know, having extreme anxiety, having to get therapy and, you know, mental health treatment because of, you know, trying to deal with this um, catastrophe for a lot of them. And so I think that's going to make it pretty tough for the judge to be like, yeah, sure, there were zero victims. Um, so anyway, that's sort of the general gist of what's in the sentencing document. Um, I'm going to read through the chat right now to catch up with questions and then we can go into more detail if you would like.
So um, as far as the, there's a question about eligible for parole, and that is true. I think that, you know, there is a difference between a 100 year sentence and a 110 year sentence in terms of that eligibility. As far as I understand it, and again, not a legal expert, but I think that federal, excuse me, federal offenders generally have to serve about 85% of their sentence. Um, so that's still a really long time. You know, 85% of 100 years versus 110 years is still a very long time. Um, but that is absolutely true that, you know, there are questions around, you know, parole and, you know, potentially getting time off his sentence and things like that. And, you know, with with any um, prison sentence, there's always the possibility that someone might, well, not any, life sentences, uh, people don't necessarily get out early. But, um, you know, with most prison sentences, there is that case, you know, that, that possibility that someone would get out early due to good behavior or, you know, things like that. Um, but ultimately, I think Bankman Freed will serve a majority of the sentence, not, not 100%, I don't think, but, you know, a, a substantial amount of that. Um, yes, someone mentioned in our historic history has mentioned that good behavior and different programs like that um, apply to a 100-year sentence or a 110-year sentence and don't apply to a life sentence. So that's true, that there is some difference between a life sentence and a 110-year sentence, despite sort of the likelihood that most humans won't live that long. <clears throat> okay, cool. So I think I'm roughly caught up. Um, so some of the stuff that I wanted to go into a little bit that I didn't sort of have the time to go into great detail in my newsletter, or I guess not the time so much as the word count. Um, I thought some of the arguments that uh, Bankman Freed's defense was making were quite unusual and interesting. Um, I'm going to see if I can pull up. Yes. Okay, so the good news is my documents are working for at least the... Um, uh, the defense's sentencing memo. So let me see if I can figure out how to add a window capture. Ooh. Is that taking up like a small part of my... What is going on here? Sorry, I once again am terrible at um, doing <laughs> live streams. Why is it so small? Ay, ay, ay. All right, gonna get rid of that for a second. I think I maybe fixed it. Unfortunately, I have to wait after I fix it for like a second to see it on the, there we go. All right. And then I think I can maybe get my face to show up still too, but maybe over in the corner. Ah, we're making it work. All right, and then I'll zoom in on the document so you guys can read a little bit better. Beautiful. All right, so this is the sentencing memo that was submitted by um, Bankman Freed. Uh, and it's pretty long. <laughs> it's 100 pages long. Uh, they've got a sort of table of contents so where you can see that they're basically making arguments around um, some of the ways that 
the pre-sentence report calculated the um, offense level and are arguing that some of that is flawed. Um, they go into a bunch of detail around Sam Bankman frieds like early life, um, his college experience, his internships, like it's this whole biographical thing. And then they have this long list of uh, portions where they argue that he's not a greedy person, he works really hard, he cares a lot about people, uh, he is, you know, sorry for what he's done. And then they go into some more arguments around, and this is how long we think he should um, be sentenced and why. Uh, and then there's also an argument around forfeiture of assets, which is another part of the sentence that we can go into at some point. But um, <clears throat> basically, like how much of um, these assets will, you know, of, of assets belonging to Sam Bankman Freed um, that have already been seized by the government will be forfeited. And then also, you know, will there be a monetary judgment in addition to uh, the. The, the sentence. Um, and so I thought this was really interesting. Let me grab my notes here. Um, the the defense team is like kind of weirdly theatrical about it. I mean, it, it's weird to me. I Like I said, I, I can't really say how often, um, you know, pre-sentence reports or sorry, uh, sentence memos look like this, but they're like quoting Abraham Lincoln in here. <laughs> um, and they go into like this very sort of dramatic writing about how they people don't know the true Bankman Freed. Um, they, in various points, condemn the pre sentence report and the um, government sentencing memo as like uh, draconian, barbaric, grotesque. Like they use all of these very uh, dramatic words. Um, and it's a little flowery compared to the government's uh, report, which does, I mean, I think they call him a pernicious megalomaniac, the government does. So, like, there's some flowery language to go around, but I feel like they definitely lean into that a lot with um, with Sam Bankman frieds side of things. Um, they also fully, like, stick with the story that Bankman fried has been telling since the beginning, which was that FTX was very successful. It was profitable. Um, it was really above board and it, you know, got audited financial statements, which again, like they may have done that to some extent, but we just had this whole trial where they were pulling out these like napkin math financial statements that, uh, Bankman Freed and Caroline Ellison had prepared and then sent to lenders that were absolutely not audited. They weren't even like, they weren't even normal financial statements. It was just like Excel spreadsheets with some guesswork in it. Um, so, you know, they're kind of rewriting the story in here. They, again, are trying to say that um, FTX and Alameda collapsed because Alameda had failed to hedge properly which again was something that came up at trial and was discussed fairly extensively. And people pointed out that like there shouldn't have been, you know, regardless of what Alameda Research was doing, its hedging decision should not have had any impact on what happened to FTX's customer money. And the issue here is that they were using the FTX customer money to make you know, bets over at Alameda. And at that point, that's when hedging or not hedging became uh, important, but it's the, you know, it's that usage of funds that's the issue. It's not the hedging. Um, and so, you know, they're sort of talking about um, all of these things that they went over at trial. And again, you know, the statement here, they're saying that it was, you know, FTX and Alameda were both solvent uh, and that it was largely the bankruptcy that has caused all of these issues for people, not Sam Bankman Freed. So kind of a wild argument to make. Um, especially in front of the judge who oversaw the whole trial, because he is surely familiar with the uh, arguments that were made at trial and the things that were largely established as fact at that point. Um, so I don't really know if uh, that's going to work so well. Sorry if you can hear my cat. <laughs> she can hear me talking. She wants to hang out, I think. Uh, I don't know how 
much this mic picks up, so maybe you didn't hear anything, but... All right, um, so they go through, you know, this whole <clears throat> story of, you know, the triumph that was FTX and then the tragedy. Um, and then they start to talk a little bit about recovery um, and say, basically, this is where I mentioned that the 100-year prison recommendation is grotesque, which, I mean, like, I don't entirely disagree with that. 100 years in prison is insane like that's a really long time um but you know definitely some flowery wording here and then they go into the same uh thing that i just mentioned earlier in the stream which is that they're trying to argue that victims are going to receive a hundred cents on the dollar now i don't know how much people have kept up with the bankruptcy proceedings with ftx but um there is a lot of disagreement between the victims and the bankruptcy team on this statement that um, creditors are going to receive 100% of their claims. Um, because the way they're calculating this recovery is they're looking at the price of the crypto assets in dollars as of the petition date, as of the bankruptcy petition date, which was like, I think, 16800 and something dollars per Bitcoin at the time. Um, now... Bitcoin is priced at something like $70,000, so more than four times that amount. And so the creditors are pretty horrified by this uh, because they, you know, if they were getting, you know, say they had one Bitcoin in their FTX account at the time of the bankruptcy, they, they would be receiving, you know, if the claims go as expected, they would be receiving a cash amount of $16,800, not one Bitcoin, which they could then sell for $70,000 or so. Um, so people are pretty peeved about that, as you might imagine. And one thing I was actually talking to someone a little bit about this earlier, I think in maybe the comments on my post, but I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that, um, you know, it's really easy to sort of think about these people who have claims on Bitcoin, for example, and I'll use Bitcoin as the example, but the same is true with a lot of cryptocurrencies, which have followed a similar price trajectory. Um, it's really easy to assume that like, you know, they paid $16,800 for that Bitcoin that's in their account, and they're just mad that they're not getting the gains, but like they're not going to lose anything. But the truth of the matter is that the price of Bitcoin in November 2022, when crypto uh, had been sort of tanking for a little while and then tanked even more after the FTX collapse, um, was like an, a pretty significant low over the past couple of years. Um, and I was looking, the last time before that, that Bitcoin was at that price was like November 2020. So for much of 2021 into sort of early to mid-2022, Bitcoin was between $30,000 and $60,000 or so. And so most, I would, I would guess, I mean, it's hard for me to say, obviously, um, you know, with certainty since I don't have any account information on these people, but my guess is a pretty significant majority of people who have claims on crypto bought that crypto within that time frame because that was when, you know, the media was going crazy over it. There were the Super Bowl ads for FTX. There was the FTX arena with the name on it. You know, Sam Bankman Fried was hobnobbing with Bill Clinton. Like there were Steph Curry was talking about it. I mean, there was like all of this hype going into it when crypto prices were higher. And so I think it's probably likely that a lot of people would actually be facing losses um, when they get the cash amount of those Bitcoins. Uh, after the bankruptcy claims are processed, assuming, again, that this is how the bankruptcy shakes out, and that's not 100% certain. So um, I have some sympathy for the creditors who would really like to see their claims returned to them in kind, you know, getting one Bitcoin back instead of the cash equivalent of it, um, or, you know, getting the dollar amount as of more recent prices so that they could, you know, if they wanted to, go buy those Bitcoins back themselves. Um but it's a little challenging because those Bitcoins don't 
exist really like ftx doesn't actually have much crypto s sitting around it's a lot of dollars that they've recovered from various places and so you know they are basically making the argument that they should return the money in in dollars so the uh so bankman freed is basically grabbing onto that oh they're going to get a hundred percent recovery and saying that therefore there were no losses which i think is a really challenging argument to make uh based on sort of the fact of how this bankruptcy is likely to play out um but there are a lot of other parts in which the government um you know sort of rebutted that argument i think there's like 10 ways they could say that that argument is flawed um one of them is that the recoveries were not something that bankman fried started to try to uh, make happen before the fraud was uncovered. And so there's apparently this sort of legal precedent that um, if a person has committed, you know, has stolen money, basically, and they try to help give the money back only after the fraud was uncovered or that the offense was uncovered, that doesn't count. You can't be like, but I tried to give it back after the police had me in handcuffs, you know, like that doesn't really work for the purposes of calculating loss. Um, and they basically are arguing that Sam Bankman fried only started to try to, you know, fulfill withdrawal requests or repay loans by Alameda's lenders or whatever it was when everything was already crashing down and it had become pretty apparent that there was uh, fraud happening there. Um, the government also makes the argument that... Um, you know, even if the judge were to accept the idea that customers are going to be made whole and that there were therefore no losses, which again, I don't think is likely, but it's possible. Um, they sort of go into these other arguments around like, okay, but even if that was true, the investors in FTX suffered $1.7 billion in losses or something like that. Um, and that alone is enough to justify the sentencing enhancement. Um, and so, you know, they sort of go through this argument where they sort of say, okay, so even if we accept this, it's flawed because of that. But even if you were to say that that's not flawed, then it's also, you know, there were losses because of this. And even if that wasn't the case, there were losses because of this. And so I think it's maybe unlikely that, um, that Judge Kaplan will like get through all of those, like, well, even if... Uh, and and say like, yeah, for sure, the losses were zero. <laughs> um, and I think that's really Bankman Freed's sort of only argument uh, in the sentencing memo, despite I mean, despite the fact that it's a hundred pages long, um, the vast majority of it is basically just arguing like there were no losses and therefore, uh, you know, he should not serve a hundred years or 40 years in prison. He should serve six. Um, this is a really interesting page, I thought, because it shows a little bit about how the offenses are or the offense level is calculated. So there's this base offense level just for the, the crime that he's being charged with. But you can see how you get from, you know, six to 56 because there are all these enhancements that can cause a sentence to be more severe than just the baseline fraud sentence. Um, and as you can see here, the majority of this this uh, 56 number comes from this plus 30 sentencing enhancement, which is based on the amount of loss. Um, and there's a table where it's like, okay, if it's above this amount, then you add, you know, two points. And if it's above this amount, you add four points. That table maxes out at $550 million. Um, and so in order for Bankman Freed to get a significant reduction in that number, he would have to not only convince the judge that, you know, it's not $8 billion, but it's not even $550 million. So yikes, uh, that seems like an uphill battle to me. Um, beyond that, you can see there are a bunch of sort of other uh, things that add to this. So 10 or more victims that have suffered substantial hardship. Um, the government goes through sort of how that's defined, but they point to things like, for example, BlockFi had to declare bankruptcy, which is definitely substantial hardship. 
Um, you know, there were people who um, lost, you know, significant amounts or lost access to significant amounts of money and therefore suffered financial hardship. You know, the victim impact statements have letters from people talking about how they had to sell their house or um, they had to take out loans or they had to change, you know, they were planning to do one thing and then they had to go back to work in a job that they hadn't planned to work in because they needed to make the money quickly. Um, so, you know, I think getting to that 10 number is pretty straightforward when there are a million victims. Um, and like I said, you know, I think there were probably at least 100 letters submitted. That's, again, me just ballpark estimating, but I think something like that. Um, there are some other ones here around like fraudulent actions in bankruptcy proceeding. And some of these I understand a little bit better than others. This one is a little hard for me to understand, the, the fraudulent actions one. Um, but they're basically arguing that like some of the actions that Sam Bankman fried took throughout the bankruptcy were fraudulent. Um, the government has uh, objected to that particular finding. There's also something about if your fraud involves sophisticated means um, and the government has argued that like, you know, he set up North Dimension, which is basically a shell company to get bank accounts. And, you know, they were doing all of this weird financial engineering and fake balance sheets and stuff like that. And so therefore it was sophisticated means um, derived a million dollars from a financial institution. Again, there's some disagreement between the two sides on that. Um, I don't remember what this means here. <laughs> uh, sophisticated money laundering. And then uh, role as organizer leader in the offense. I think that one's pretty clean, uh, clear cut that he was kind of the head honcho in this. Um, and then abusive position of public or private trust um, is kind of an interesting one. Basically, they're arguing that he had a position of trust as, you know, sort of this figurehead of the FTX crypto exchange that people sort of put their trust in him personally um, and even, you know, viewed him as a fiduciary, even though he, you know, argues that he wasn't because the terms of service say he wasn't. Anyway, so there's, there's a bunch of stuff in here. Um, but I think ultimately, like, even nitpicking over these, like, plus two numbers probably won't accomplish much in terms of that offense level just because it's so high at this point. Um, and so, you know, like I said, Bankman Freed is sort of trying to get that 30 number to go away, which starts to bring the sentence back down into a more reasonable um, level that he can then argue about. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is a line that I quoted in my newsletter, but all italics, you know, the harm to customers, lenders, and investors is zero, which is just like such a bold thing to say. Um, and I, again, I don't expect it to go well for him trying to lean on this argument, but I also don't really know what alternative he had um, other than trying to make that argument. Um, Just looking through to make sure I'm getting all my notes. Yeah, so here's where they argue a little bit over the bankruptcy proceeding, you know, the the false statements in or the fraudulent uh, actions in the course of a bankruptcy proceeding. You know, he's saying that he basically had nothing to do with the bankruptcy and therefore it's not possible that he committed fraud. And like, I can sort of see the point in some of the arguments that they make. I, I mentioned this in um, my newsletter as well, but like, they also, the government tries to really lean into this argument that Sam Bankman fried never accepted responsibility for his actions uh, and that therefore he should not get, you can get like a downward adjustment in your offense level based on accepting uh, responsibility or if, you know, if you plead guilty, then people often get it for that. Um, and... Um, the government is saying he absolutely shouldn't get it because he's never accepted responsibility and he, you know, any statements that he's made that, you know, could be taken to be uh, apologetic or anything like that are totally false and contrived. Um, and, you know, the, gov or the, the defense team is arguing that, like, he's trying to he maintains his innocence. He plans to appeal this conviction. Of course, he's not going to say like, yeah, I did it. I'm sorry. 
and get that downward departure. And it's within his rights to maintain his innocence and to appeal the conviction. And so, like, it's not really fair to say that he hasn't accepted responsibility just because he hasn't, um, you know, admitted fault, basically. Um, but, you know, again, as I wrote in my newsletter, like, this is sort of academic because it's like we're talking about, like, variations of one or two points, not you know, something that would meaningfully impact that 56 or 43 or whatever number um, downward departure. So, or uh, that point uh, offense level. Um, yeah, so they go into this like very long uh, discussion. Where does it start? This very long discussion of Sam Bankman Freed's sort of like background, which is kind of wild to read. Um, again, they they are quoting people, uh, talking about you know they they pull this quote from, I think another case where you know they're saying like if he's to receive credit for the good he has done, it should be at sentencing. And then they sort of go into how he's a brilliant, complex, and humane person. Um, they really focus on the fact that he doesn't use drugs or drink alcohol, which is like, I don't really think that's relevant. Like, if he did drink alcohol, does that really make a difference when it comes to fraud? Um, and then they sort of, like, they go into this whole background about him and how he was quiet growing up, but he was so gifted and smart. Um, they talk a lot about his uh, veganism, and that's something that also came up incredibly often in the character reference letters that were submitted um people i like and i'm still kind of baffled by this um because like in the character reference letters they are talking about him being vegan as though it's like the most incredible evidence of him being a good person um and i was like it was so emphasized in these letters that I like genuinely found myself trying to figure out if Judge Kaplan is a vegan and therefore might have some bias towards like vegans. Um, as far as I can tell, he's not. I don't think Judge Kaplan's a vegan. I couldn't find any suggestion that he was. But um, my best guess as to why it came up so much is that so many of the people who uh, submitted these letters are either themselves vegan or run into like they run in the sort of effective altruism communities themselves where veganism is like very highly uh, considered and so like they just have I think genuinely I think that like the people who submitted these letters just have this belief in their head that like everyone views veganism as like this incredibly wonderful testament to someone's character and not like just a dietary choice um but it's pretty incredible to see like how much they lean on that and like there are letters from people they they recently submitted a couple more letters I think last night and there's a letter from someone who like went to college with Sam Bankman Freed and hasn't seen him since and he's like I basically can't testify to Bankman Freed's current character, but he was a vegan when we were in college. And that says a lot, you know, and it's like, wow, is that the best letter that they could get? Um, you know, they could only find some like very long time ago classmate who was like, well, he was vegan. So that's pretty wild. Um, there's also a lot of reference to Bankman Freed's um, mental health and like neurodiversity. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, oh yeah, here's, here's veganism. Oh, sorry, before we go into the autism thing, I thought this was such a wild paragraph <laughs> where they say that it wasn't stealing, it was risk shifting. He he basically put all of this risk onto his victims and that's how they lost money is because he was gambling with their money. 
Like, that does not seem like a very compelling argument to me, but maybe there's some legal background there that I missed that makes that more convincing. I was blown away when I read this. Um, here we go. So here's where they start to talk about his Sam's condition. Um, and they're basically saying that he was, uh, I don't know what his, yeah. His, so he's diagnosed with ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. Um, and they go into, you know, how that might affect how he's perceived. Um, and also they make this argument that he would be more vulnerable in prison as a result of his autism than, you know, a, a neurotypical person. Um, and, you know, I, I actually have no real reason to doubt that. Um, the I would say that the comments about his autism that were made in the uh, sentencing memo were a lot more reasonable than some of the ones that came in through the character support letters, the, the character reference letters. Um, oops, I just zoomed that in and now it's hard to see. Boop, boop. Um, some of the letters that came in <clears throat> were kind of bananas as far as um, their characterizations of people with autism. Um, there were two more of them submitted last night, but there were also a couple in the initial batch of letters. There were like, I don't know, 30 letters or so attached with the sentencing memo, and then they put another five in last night. And two of the ones last night came from parents of autistic people neither of whom I think knew Sam Bankman-Fried in any sense. Um, one of them had watched um, um, Michael Lewis's 60 Minutes interview about Sam Bankman-Fried. And for those who are not familiar, Michael Lewis is the author of like a bunch of different financial books, um, including Going Infinite, which is his most recent book. And it's all about Sam Bankman-Fried, who he was like following around um, before the FTX collapse and then had to sort of pivot the book into covering the whole disaster at FTX. But ultimately, it was like incredibly friendly to Bankman-Fried. I did a review on it um, in my newsletter if you want to read it. Um, but and I'll point out that the book is cited three times in the sentencing memo and also referenced several times in the character reference letters. Uh, so it seems to be doing or being used to sort of bolster this image of Sam Bankman fried as this like uh, somewhat naive boy who didn't really know what he was doing and made a big mistake. Um, but one, yeah, one of the people, you know, basically saw Michael Lewis talking about Sam Bankman fried and identified the person he was describing as being similar to their son, uh, who is also around Sam Bankman frieds age and is apparently autistic. Um, and she basically makes this argument that, like, he probably didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know it was wrong. Um, and it was all very, like, pretty offensive, I guess, to, to people with autism, as though that, like, autism causes you to commit enormous fraud or like have no respect for other people's uh well-being or, or something like that um so I don't know if that's gonna fly with the judge uh it certainly didn't come off as compelling to me but I'm not Judge Kaplan um and you know I, th I think if they're gonna make Personally, I think if they're going to make arguments around autism, the one that, like, he could be targeted in prison um, is more compelling than, like, he was just a small bean who didn't know what he was doing. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. But yeesh. <laughs> um, okay, and then they go into this argument around you should consider the fact that Sam Bankman fried is already being punished when you decide to sentence him. And, you know, the idea is that you should give him a lesser sentence because of all of this hardship he has endured. Some of it is, you know, compelling. They argue that, you know, his the conditions in the prison in the Bahamas were terrible, um, as are the conditions in MDC Brooklyn. 
Uh, I don't think either of those, I mean, I think everyone pretty much acknowledges that the conditions in those jails are not good. Um, although at one point they talk about how, I forget where it is, but at one point they write that, oh yeah, it's right here, <laughs> that while he was in this Fox Hill jail in the Bahamas for eight days, he did not see the sky. And I just like kind of had to laugh at that because like Sam Bankman frieds whole thing is that he's a nerd who works around the clock and like sleeps in a beanbag chair and is off. <clears throat> there we go. I'm back. All right. Uh, that was weird. My um, monitor briefly went black like my computer fell asleep and then my camera just stopped working. So clearly I am being ddos by the crypto lobby or something. <laughs> Uh, anyways, apologies for the sudden change in camera angle. Uh, hopefully that will not happen again. I don't know how people stream, like, daily because it always breaks for me. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, uh, the argument that Sam Bankman fried doesn't see the, si the sky or didn't see the sky when he was in the Fox Hill prison is somewhat, uh, not compelling to me compared to, like, the other uh injustices that people face in prison uh but that was just me kind of finding that amusing as someone who also likes to stay inside um and like the other thing too about the arguments around mdc brooklyn is that like they're absolutely legitimate that mdc brooklyn is known for being uh a really terrible place to have to spend any time but like Judge Kaplan is pretty, like, used to having people sent to MDC Brooklyn as a judge in the Southern District of New York. And so the argument that he should receive a lenient sentence because he's had to spend time in MDC Brooklyn would presumably apply to any, sent like, many of the sentences, at least, that Judge Kaplan uh, has to hand down. And so I'm not sure if that will uh, work terribly well. The, one of the wilder things that they've argued is that Sam Bingman fried has suffered because he has been covered in the news, quite negatively, obviously, um, and that, uh, you know, this negative news coverage will basically, uh, has basically, you know, caused him a lot of pain uh, to him and to his family, that, you know, it sort of ruined his reputation and that kind of thing. Um, and they even at some point um, basically blame the negative news coverage on the prosecutors. They say that, you know, they pursued a highly publicized prosecution um, and that because of all of this coverage, you know, it, that will satisfy the deterrent effect. Um, as I wrote in my newsletter, I think maybe it was the crime that caused the negative coverage and not the prosecution of the crime. Um, but this just seemed like a pretty uh, Hail Mary argument to me that like, but the press reported negatively on this fraudster and so therefore he shouldn't have to spend time in prison. Um, they also talk about his financial circumstances that, you know, this has cost him and will continue to cost him financially. It has cost him his company, his livelihood. These are arguments that I suspect are not super compelling to all of the victims who also lost their livelihoods and they're, you know, suffered enormous financial costs. Um, I was, you know, it just seems like a pretty brazen argument to make. Um, and then they start to talk about uh, how Sam has calculated that this FTX collapse has turned his expected value of his life into negative territory. If if the phrase expected value is unfamiliar to you, I'm so glad because that's a very effective altruist thing to say that, you know, basically trying to assign a numerical value to a person's life where, you know, the good deeds that someone does are positive and then any bad deeds that they do are negative. Um, 
Sam Bankman Freed apparently thinks he's fallen into the negative territory. So guess he's sticking with effective altruism in jail. Um, but the government actually seizes on that particular point, this this particular paragraph in the uh, defense's sentencing memo to say that this actually strikes them as a reason he would be likely to reoffend, because, you know, if the worst thing in the world for you is to have your life turn out having negative expected value, then it might seem reasonable to you to take a huge risk in hopes of getting your life back into positive territory, like, say, doing more financial fraud and then donating all the money to charity or something like that. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I, this phrase did not sit well, sit well with the prosecutors. Um, again, we'll see again how the judge actually interprets that. But um, it's interesting to sort of see the effect of altruism shining through here. Uh, and then they go into talking about how he's doing so much good in prison by helping prisoners study for their GEDs. I think there was another part where they said that he was also giving them financial advice or something like that. I was like, oh, God. Um, but, you know, he's he's trying to make the best of his time in prison, I guess. Uh, or in, in jail, in this case. <clears throat> and then they argue that, you know, he the the threat that he might reoffend is nil, that he will, will never have the opportunity to repeat this offense. He will never again be in the position of running a financial company. I would submit that they should really just look at the crypto industry because there are so many fraudsters who have come into the crypto industry and committed more fraud. There are so many people who have like tanked crypto projects and then started new ones immediately after. Um, I mean, just look at the Three Arrows Capital guys, right? Like those guys absolutely blew up a hedge fund, are basically being pursued by liquidators and, you know, various other authorities and have started at least two projects since then. And people are putting money into those projects. So the idea that like, oh, he did this big fraud and so no one will ever trust them with trust him with their money is like, boy, you should look at the crypto industry. <laughs> Um, all right. And then, oh yeah. And so then at the end, <clears throat> they start to go into comparisons of Sam Bankman frieds case to other financial frauds. Um, I thought this was really interesting. Uh, you know, they're basically looking at other somewhat recent financial cases and saying that okay, well, you shouldn't compare Sam Bankman-Fried to this one because of X, Y, and Z. Um, in the government senten sentencing memo, they have they sort of go through recent financial fraud cases as well and sort of compare the sentences that came out of those to try to say that a 40 to 50 year sentence is pretty average for some of the similarly sized financial frauds. Um, and this is the defense sort of trying to make the argument against that. Um, so they, they pick the Bernie Madoff case as the first one, uh, especially given that Madoff was sentenced to 150 years in prison. And then they basically go into how, oh, well, you know, FTX was nothing like the Madoff fraud, despite quite the uh, many comparisons to it that we've seen in the media. Um, they basically are saying that, um, you know, that part of a major part of uh, Bernie Madoff's sentence was um, because he was older, and so uh, because of that, this 150-year sentence was much more of a symbolic sentence than one of a similar length would be for someone who's 32 years old. Um, which I actually think is kind of reasonable to say that, like uh, a lot of the thought that seems to be going into determining a potential sentence for Sam Bankman Freed, both on the government side and on the um, uh, defense side, is around like he's so young, you know, do we really want him to die in prison versus, you know, when someone's 71 years old, um, 
the potential prison sentence that could result in him dying in prison would be fairly short, honestly. Um, and as they point out here, he, he served 12 years before he died. Um, but, you know, they also try to make these arguments that, um, oh, well, look, you know, Madoff was preying on people who thought that they were making conservative investments, you know, in pension funds and things like that, and that crypto traders have a very different risk profile, which seemed like some serious victim blaming to me that like, oh, crypto traders knew they were getting into it. Um, and like, I see where that comes from. And I see the impulse to make that kind of argument around crypto people. Um, because there are some who are, you know, kind of doing that like degen crypto trading. They're looking for, you know, shit coins that are going to get them a thousand percent returns and things like that. Um, you know, even Bitcoin is a very risky crypto asset. It has these huge price swings, as we've obviously seen. Um, but I think it's maybe a little bit unfair to characterize all of the crypto people as having such, you know, such this, such a um, strong appetite for risk, because a lot of people were looking for returns on stable coins, for example. Um, they had been told that FTX was something like a bank where, you know, you could actually make returns on your assets beyond what you might be able to make from a traditional bank. But, you know, it was similarly safe and that, you know, even if there was risk involved with the assets that you'd chosen, you would still have access to those assets. Um, and so this, I don't know, rubbed me the wrong way to some extent. It also ignores the fact that there was a pension fund that had put a lot of money into FTX and had to write it off to zero. Um, I think it was the Canadian, it was like Ontario Teachers Pension Plan or something like that. Um, so that seems like kind of a flawed argument there as well. Um, they go into another one around um, the OneCoin cryptocurrency fraud. So if you're not familiar with that, this is the fraud that um, the sort of primary perpetrator of it is a woman named Ruja Ignatova, who goes by Crypto Queen. And she's been on the run for a while now and was placed on, I think, Interpol's most wanted list like a year ago or something like that. So she's in the wind. But some of her co-conspirators have been arrested and charged. Um, and this is one of those where uh, this guy named Greenwood was charged. Um, and the argument here is that, oh, well, OneCoin was designed from the outset as a fraud, whereas FTX was legitimate when it started. Um, again, I think that's something that can be argued <laughs> because FTX started dipping into the cookie jar pretty early on um, when it comes to uh some of the malfeasance that was happening behind the scenes i mean it was founded in i forget if it was 2017 or 2019 but you know at least by 2020 they were already doing stuff that was pretty shady um and so it's like well was it really that legitimate to begin with or was it also designed as a fraud you know who knows um and Excuse me. Sorry, my throat always gets really sore when I do this. Um, they also try to sort of push back against this idea that like, oh, well, these guys were greedy. Sam Bankman fried isn't greedy. You know, he wasn't buying Lambos for himself. Uh, he was just spending all the money on uh, buying influence and Bahamian real estate and uh, making investments in AI companies. Um, they go into WorldCom which was a, obviously a huge fl fraud. Uh, and yeah, they say here that these defendants were experienced executives who'd been in the business world for decades. And Sam was just a small boy who didn't know that he was supposed to do things like not spend his customers money. And then they use this phrase here, which is like so out of place in an otherwise very serious document. They write, he was, in essence, flying by the seat of his cargo shorts. And like, I'm not sure what they expect the judge is going to be like, nah, you know, like, it's just such a weird sort of joke to put in there. Um, and then finally, they, of course, compare this to Elizabeth Holmes. 
uh, who was charged and sentenced not too long ago, a couple years ago, maybe. Um, so she got a handful of years, I think 10-ish, 13 years, 12 years, something like that. Uh, I'm trying to do mental math here. Um, and they're saying, oh, no, 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 he's nothing like Elizabeth Holmes, even though she was also convicted of fraud. Um, part of the argument here is that, well, you know, well, first they talk about how similar they are, which is like, maybe you shouldn't really emphasize that. But um, they also say that, you know, basically because Elizabeth Holmes was running a medical devices company, her fraud was so much worse than his. Um, and like, I get that. You know, like, for example, the, the the things they say here are pretty terrible. Like, you know, telling someone that, you know, giving someone inaccurate results for a supposed cancer test, you know, things like that are pretty devastating and, and doing, you know, do a lot of harm. Um, but the idea that Sam Bankman frieds fraud did not harm people in similar ways just seems pretty bananas to me. You know, they make this argument further down that Sam Bankman-Fried could not and would not cause physical harm or bodily injury to another living being. And it's like, well, how do you define that? Because, you know, if someone can't afford the medical care that they need because of your huge financial fraud, or if someone commits suicide because of your huge financial fraud, like, you kind of are sort of culpable for some of that, even though you didn't injure them in the same way that, you know, it wasn't Elizabeth Holmes punching someone in the face, you know, but it was a result of her actions and a result of her company that people were injured. Um, so oof, I don't really know about that one, but they say he is significantly less blameworthy because there was no physical harm as a result of his actions. And then, of course, they find a case which just so happens to have a very small sentence attached to it that they say is much more accurate compared to Sam Bankman Freed's. Um, although they do they do point out that he was initially sentenced to 10 years in prison, which is still longer than they want for Sam Bankman Freed. Um, but he did serve substantially less of it because he eventually cooperated with authorities to take down um, other people, I think, involved in the um scheme but yeah again they're they're describing bankman fried as a genius um and then they talk about how this guy because he was released after 2 years made such a positive impact afterwards because he created a foundation and he does uh, medical research out of it and you know he's basically doing all these things that are so good and oh wouldn't sam probably do the same thing. You know, wouldn't he dedicate his post-prison life to charitable works, finding the best ways to help others and put them into practice consistent with his commitment to effective altruism? Um, they make these types of arguments a couple of times throughout, and I find them incredibly unconvincing because um, Tim Bankman-Fried has been an effective altruist since college or so, and he seems to have believed he was living up to effective altruist ideals this whole way through. And so clearly his vision of what, you know, satisfies the um, definition of doing good for the effective altruist community is like very different than the average person. And so the idea that like, oh, but now his commitment to effective altruism isn't going to convince him to do fraud now his effective altruism is going to make him go cause, you know, go start a foundation and do medical research or something. Um, so like, <laughs> like past experience does not really shed a positive light on how Sam Bankman frieds effective altruism is going to influence his future decisions. Um, and there's actually a, a quote somewhere. Let me see if it comes up soon. Oh, no, because it's in a different... They There were several other filings after the government submitted their memo, and it's in one of those. But um, the defense says something along the lines of, like, Sam Bankman-Fried would be... You know, he, he would never want to do something that would see a philanthropic organization lose its reputation. 
Um, and this is a, as part of an argument that he would not reoffend. And it's like, what are you talking about? He just caused effective altruism to have like the worst reputational damage it has ever suffered in its entire existence. Why would now, you know, why why is it that now he suddenly is not going to want to bring disrepute to a philanthropic uh, project? Like, it just seems like completely ahistorical to try to make those arguments. Um, so anyway, we are basically at the end of this. Um, he, there are some more arguments around, um, I think it's kind of a new guideline. Yeah, there's a, there's a very new guideline that talks about zero point offenders, which are people who have no criminal history. Um, and that includes Sam Bankman Freed. And this adjustment to the, um, sentencing recommendations basically argues that people, um, I mean, I think some of it has to do with basically this change that allows people to, um, spend some of their sentence in home confinement. Um, but they are making the argument that based on these sentencing guidelines, um, he, as a zero point offender, generally should not go to prison and should, you know, achieve or should be given some other kind of sentence. Um, so, uh, I mean, again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't really know how convincing that argument is. Um, and, you know, that's kind of why I didn't write about it yesterday. But um, it definitely seemed a little creative. That's like, well, he's never done crimes before. And so this enormous crime that he's committed should just be, you know, a slap on the wrist. Um, and then they finally address the forfeiture question. They say they say in this filing that they believe that Sam Bankman fried should have zero forfeiture. But in a later filing, they say that they don't. Um, object to the forfeiture of assets that have already been seized, which are like his Robin Hood shares, which were, I think, eventually sold for around $600 million. Uh, there's another $20 million, another $50 million, $5 million. You know, there's big monetary amounts. And then I think there were some jets, um, some crypto accounts, things like that. So, I don't think he's trying to argue that he should get all that back. But what he does argue later on is that the $11 billion monetary um, judgment that the government has argued for is not warranted. Um, they say basically it's going to ruin him. You know, he will never be able to satisfy that type of a judgment because he will never have $11 billion in the future. Um and that it's unconstitutional because it would basically um, be completely financially ruinous to him. Uh, again, not some. I'm not someone who can very uh, is not very qualified to evaluate the constitutionality of something like this. Um, but I'll be really curious to see tomorrow how that one goes over. So we've now made it to the end of this document. Um, and this is, it ends with just his sentence request. So basically he says that, okay, we should get, uh, we should consider a 26 offense level, which would yield a sentence of 63 to 78 months, which as I mentioned is five and a quarter to six and a half years. Um, so, you know, ballpark, they're talking about a six year sentence. Um, and they hope that, you know, if he was released after, six years or, you know, some amount of that six-year sentence, he could then be returned to a productive role in society, um, whatever that may be. All right, I'm going to try to catch up on the chat here in case people had any questions. Um, I'm not going to go through the government's uh, sentencing memo in, in detail unless there's anything that people really want to talk about, um, because I, I talked about it in quite a lot of detail in my newsletter, so you can always go check that out. Um, and so I think I'll probably wrap it up pretty soon after just going through the chat because we've also gone through the, the letters and stuff. Um, let me just... Boop, boop, boom. I hate trying to catch up to the chat because it's always... Um, 
it like skips ahead when you're scrolling. Yeah, so someone says they're curious what the judge will sentence. Um, I am too. <laughs> I've heard a lot of different estimates floating around. Um, I Coindesk published something today where they consulted a couple of lawyers who guessed at maybe 25 years. I saw another lawyer writing, or I don't know if he's a lawyer. I think he's a lawyer. Um that 25 years seemed fairly reasonable because, you know, judges often will sort of split the difference between what uh, the prosecution and the defense have requested. But that particular person also said that he could see a variance in either direction happening. And so it could be longer, it could be shorter. Um, again, like the maximum sentence here is 110 years and it is possible, like there have been cases where judges have gone above what prosecutors um, have requested. And so, you know, Judge Kaplan could come out and say, like, actually, 100 years sounds good. Um, I don't know if that's particularly likely. I don't think it is, but it, it could happen. Um, my guess, which is, again, not terribly well informed as someone who's not in the legal profession, but my guess is it'll be something like 40 years. Um I get the sense that uh, I, I definitely got the sense during the trial that Judge Kaplan was not pleased with Sam Bankman Freed. Um, and that can definitely impact sentencing, especially if he believes that Bankman Freed perjured himself, um, things like that. So my bet is on the higher end. And I, I say bet very colloquially. I don't have any money on this. Um, although I did go and look at the prediction markets because. Um, Betting markets can sometimes be surprisingly on point when it comes to predicting things. And Poly Market, which is one of these betting markets, um, was pretty evenly split when I looked at it. Let me let me see if I can pull it up for you guys. I just don't want to give you the wrong number. Here we go. Um, nope. I've made a big mistake. <laughs> I need to do the other one. There she is. What did I do earlier to make this fit to screen? That's the magic button. All right, so Poly Market has apparently a million dollars bet on this um, around Sam Bankman Freed's sentence. And it's pretty evenly split here among people who think he will get 20 to 30 years, 30 to 40 years, and 40 to 50 years. And then there are some outliers who think 5 to 10, 10 to 20, and then more than 50. Um, there's also a small number of people who think less than 5. My cat's yelling again. <laughs> um, so this is kind of interesting to, to see. Uh, you know, like I said, sometimes prediction markets can be informative. Obviously, it's not like they have the inside scoop, I assume. <laughs> um, but definitely another data point to look at there. Um, oh, no. There we go. way no nope. there we go <laughs> I know there's some way to do like scenes with OBS but I am not good at that so we're just doing it the old-fashioned way okay um let's see what else
Oh, the other um, sort of line of argument they go into in their memo is basically that um, the sentencing guidelines are flawed and that they tend to result in overlong sentences for white collar criminals um, because they, they basically say that like, oh, this loss calculation table is, um, you know, completely unconnected to reality and, and, you know, ends up providing these practically lifelong sentences to people who have committed financial fraud. Um, and I thought that was kind of a bold move because they're in the Southern District of New York, which is like where financial fraud cases are prosecuted. And just like the idea that Judge Kaplan would be like, oh, you know what? Maybe these sentencing guidelines are unfair. Like it just strikes me as pretty unlikely um, that that would be compelling to him. But I mean, it's worth a shot, I guess. Like, I feel like at this point, they're just kind of at the try everything and see if anything works stage. Um, And I think personally that Sam Bankman frieds hopes are probably tied up in his appeal and not in the sentencing. Um, He does intend to appeal, which I mean, he said that at least. Um, And uh, you know, he has to wait until after he's sentenced to do so, which is why he hasn't done it yet. Um, so, you know, I think personally, I, if I had to guess, he still thinks he can get out of this. Um, it sort of matches the attitude he's shown so far, which is that he, he I think, genuinely believes that, you know, he, he can get away with this somehow. <laughs> um, but anyway. All right. I just want to make sure that we go back up through I promise my cat is not being tortured she just (laughs) she gets a little lonely sometimes and decides to yell about it I will go give her lots of pets after this stream in fact I purchased her a special fancy treat today which she's going to get tomorrow because tomorrow is her adoption anniversary Oh, thank you for whoever did the math on Elizabeth Holmes' sentence. She got 11 years, three months. I appreciate that. Um, She didn't really make that I'm just a small boy argument to the extent that Bankman Freed did, but um, she did get a, I mean, a lighter sentence than what the government is hoping Bankman Freed will get. So we'll see. I don't think BitConnect has come up in the uh, sentencing memos, no. Someone here says, Sam bankman fried wouldn't physically attack a person, so clearly he should be acquitted. Which, like, you say that as a joke, but, like, there were several sentencing, or several character uh, reference letters that basically said that like he he's not a violent criminal and therefore he shouldn't go to prison which I mean I get the argument there I personally like I have strong feelings about the prison system but I feel like the time to argue for prison reform and like light sentencing for nonviolent offenders is maybe not when you're talking you know when you're trying to get your buddy out of jail <laughs> um but you know Whatever. Um, I'm trying to read quickly. Have we mentioned the veganism? I did talk about that in the stream, but I don't know if that's just a joke about the fact that he <laughs> talks about his veganism very often. According so. Um, one of the character reference letters that was submitted was from another inmate and they don't really mention this in much detail, but the inmate is a cop. He's a New York City cop who is in jail right now because he's been charged with 
basically child sex offenses, um, which like, I don't know if I would want to have someone like that on my side, but that's apparently who they decided should write the like inmate reference letter. And he talks about how Sam Bankman fried you know, is his jail experience is going. Um, and he does say that Sam Bankman fried is maintaining his veganism in jail, which is not a small feat. I mean, like prison food, I don't think is particularly good, regardless of if you're a vegan or not. But it does sound like, you know, the substantially smaller options you're presented with as a vegan are not particularly enjoyable. Um but several of the character reference letters were, like, very impressed with him for remaining vegan in prison and seemed to think he should be treated more lightly because of that, which, again, don't really follow that, but worth a shot. Oh, yeah, someone mentioned the... Um, the notes that Bankman Freed had come up with, which I'll see if I can pull them up because they're pretty wild to read. The government attached these in um, their sentencing submission. Oh, that's annoying. I have to pull them up from Court Listener because my document program is not syncing as it should be. There were several Google documents that they attached, and they are all kind of wild. Um, Sam Bankman fried was like a prolific note taker, which is really not the best characteristic for someone who's going to commit financial fraud. Um, there we go. One of the documents that the government was able to pull from his Google Docs folder had, it It starts out, it says, note, these are all random, probably bad ideas that aren't vetted. And then it goes on to list a bunch of ideas that he's had that seem mostly focused on trying to rehabilitate his reputation. Um, nope, that's the wrong window. There we go. I don't know why they it always starts out as big like this. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm like hovering in the background here. Nope. Wrong one. <laughs> there we go me over here all right um so hopefully you can see this uh this was apparently sam bankman fried's ideation shortly after the ftx companies collapsed they had gone into bankruptcy and then i think this was like within a couple of days of that maybe um and these were all the ideas he had about how to sort of spin things in his favor um, there are all these links in here that were left in this filing, and they all go to other Google documents that I obviously don't have access to, although I wish I did. It would be wonderful if he just left his, like, Google Drive unprotected, but sadly didn't. Um, but it's kind of wild to read because some of it is, like, um, talking about how they should how he should like condemn the chapter 11 team and that like if it wasn't for the chapter 11 team everything would be fine um another one here is basically saying that they have no idea how to run the company it's colonial i don't know i don't know what he means by that um it's run by a cartel of lawyers they also you know go he goes into other arguments about um you know Basically, he's saying, I have the funding ready to make customers whole, but it's the Chapter 11 team that's getting in the way. So he, he goes into, you know, those types of arguments. But then he also suggests the complete opposite, which is go with the lawyers were in a shitty situation. Um, there's another one where he basically says, 
here. Yeah, go with the go strong with the message. I'm really glad the chapter 11 team has stepped in. They're great. You know, so he's he's like trying to decide which of two completely different uh tactics to go with. It seems like he's gone with the one that is basically condemning uh the chapter 11 team, Sullivan Cromwell, lawyers involved with the FTX bankruptcy. Um and like it kind of makes me skeptical of his arguments about them. I think there are some legitimate criticisms of the way that the bankruptcy is being run, the potential conflicts of interest with Sullivan and Cromwell, which did legal work for FTX before the FTX collapse and is now doing much of the legal work um, to try to you know, handle the aftermath. Um, but it definitely makes me take anything he says about them with a grain of salt because it just seems really calculated. Um, but there are a couple of other ideas in here about rehabilitating his reputation that were pretty wild, including go on Tucker Carlson, come out as a Republican, um, you know, trying to claim that his um, donations were actually super Republican and that, you know, the public contributions don't show that, which is true. You know, most of his public political donations were sort of Democratic Um largely because he funneled the Republican ones through straw donors, which is a crime. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he's basically saying, oh, I should come out against the woke agenda. Um, there's another Google document that is attached, I think, to the same filing. Let me see. Is it right here? No, that's the same one. Here. Yeah. You can see this, right? Yeah, you can. Um, this one here is also attached to the same document. Um, first, he's like coming up with ideas of people who might be helpful, which include like Cory Booker. Uh, strangely, there's a uh, Christina Roll, who's who is a lawyer who represented him briefly in the Bahamas shortly after the collapse, and and she ended up testifying at trial. Um, and then a whole bunch of reporters that he thinks might be useful to him. Um, I was so upset to see my name not on this list. Also, he misspelled Tiffany Fong. He's not a great speller because he misspelled Tucker Carlson also. But anyway, what I was going to point out in this one is that he's he starts thinking about getting support from what he calls random subgroups, including the alt-right or some other displaced group. So he's like kind of grasping at straws for how to establish a narrative um, again, you can see his his points about uh, narrative here. Um, there's this, which I don't know what negative on uranium means. If anyone knows what that means, I'm very curious. Um, he also has a list of enemies, and I'm, again, upset that I didn't make this list. Um, it includes Ryan Miller, who is the general counsel for FTX US, John J. Ray III, who's the bankruptcy CEO. I'm not sure who Duffy is. And then I guess he thinks that Martin Shkreli would be a good ally, which is a wild thing to say, but maybe. Um, and then he's got random narratives. SBF died for our sins. So like very much actively thinking about um, how he can twist the narrative in his own favor. And this is something that the government included um, mostly in their arguments that like he's not genuine about remorse. He's trying to craft this narrative. And also he's very skilled at crafting narratives. And, you know, it seems likely to them that after he is released, if he is released at a young enough age, he would try to craft a narrative that was favorable to him that would allow him to start another crypto exchange or, you know, otherwise uh, steal money from more people. Um, so let's go back to this one real quick. Yeah, so the rest of it is, again, just more ideas of how to craft the narrative, come out as extremely pro-crypto, pro-freedom, come out with a strong anti-Binance message. He sort of did that to some extent after the collapse where he tried to blame the collapse on Binance. Um, he wants Michael Lewis to interview him. So he clearly sees Michael Lewis as a fairly friendly figure. He also keeps mentioning Matt Levine, who he I can't tell how he feels about Matt Levine. Um because he doesn't list him as like a helpful reporter, but he comes up here too. Um, I think he thinks that if he can just like out 
debate Matt Levine, then maybe it would be good for his image. I would love to see that. Maybe he can do like a telephone interview from jail. Um, this is an interesting one where he says, lean into the story that it was because of tail wrist crashes. This was improbable because this is kind of what he did. Um, and so it's like, is that really what he truly believes or is that just this narrative that he's, he's come up with? Um, Alameda was incompetent. He suggests doing radical honesty on Twitter. I love that honesty is number 15 in this list. <laughs> He's like, well, okay, we've considered 14 other options, but maybe I should just be honest, uh, but on Twitter. Um, and then I don't know what this letter is, but apparently he did it. There's a tweet thread that he wanted to make about MSAM, which is the um, um, antidepressant patch that he used. I think people were, there was a lot of speculation right around the time of the collapse that he was basically abusing the MSAM patches. Um, wait, is MSAM antidepressant or ADHD? Hold on. Oh, it is depressant. Depression. Um, but pe people were basically saying that like he was so amped up on these MSAM patches that that was why he made all these mistakes and and decided to take on so much risk and so i'm guessing that the tweet thread that he re references here is him trying to debunk some of that um number 18 is apparently crowdfund ideas or crowdsource ideas for what to do uh and then 19 try to get people to support the true narratives and again this is a google doc that i can't access as you can see so sadly Um, blink, make me big again. Voila. <laughs> All right. Um, going back through the questions. is what happened in one of these plans. I don't know. Maybe that was a tweet thread that he had drafted. Um, we still haven't gotten the story about the what happened Twitter thread, but um, isn't he Jewish? That's not exactly Gucci with the alt-right. You say that, but there are surprisingly a lot of people on the far right who are Jewish. Um, it's definitely not the most popular trait among people in the alt-right, but it doesn't seem to stop everyone from joining the group. Um, I just love that he was like, I'm going to write all of this down where it can easily be accessed in discovery. Oh, thank you for that correction. You're absolutely right. Christina Roll was on the list as someone who might be helpful. And she is actually the head of the Securities Commission in the Bahamas. Crystal Roll was the lawyer who helped him uh, after the collapse. Uh, this came up, this confusion came up in uh, the trial. And it turns out that Roll is the most common surname in the Bahamas, which I didn't know until that trial. So yeah, I that was my mistake. Yeah, I'm surprised that CoffeeZilla wasn't on the enemies list. Um, I'm not sure why he decided he needed to make a list of enemies, like, but I don't know. Um, yeah, veganism not on his list of ideas. It like I wonder to what extent this whole vegan narrative is something that Sam Bankman Fried came up with because like. I never felt like he was that outspoken about being vegan. It, it came up, you know, it was something that reporters like to mention, but it never seemed like something that like he mentioned all that much. Um, so I don't know if that's his idea or if, if the lawyers are pushing it or if it's something that they're just trying because it's mentioned so much in all these letters, but whoosh. Um. 
Do we know when the DOJ first opened their case against Bankman Freed? We know the people at Solcrom went after the collapse, but did the DOJ already have their case open? Um, we don't really know. The We know when the indictment was unsealed, um, but like as far as when the investigation started, I don't think, I don't think that's been disclosed. Um, but I mean, the people at Sullivan and Cromwell were, um, were helping FTX with like normal business matters, you know, like that, that type of stuff. Not, um, it's not like they were brought on earlier to, uh, help with an, an, like a secret DOJ investigation, at least as far as I know. Um, but they were doing like pretty normal, like transactional stuff as far as I can tell. Yeah, regarding the cop as the character witness, like, I don't really know what the calculus was there, d you know, deciding to use a cop who is currently incarcerated on child sex offenses, on, on charges of child sex offenses. Like, maybe the thought was that him being a cop would be enough to, like, make Kaplan sympathetic to him. Maybe they didn't think that the child sex offenses would be particularly upsetting for whatever reason and that like the cop thing would somehow win out over that. But part of me wonders if that was like the only option they had. Um, I, like, I mean, he's in he's in a unit at MDC Brooklyn that's for basically high profile um, inmates. So it's people who were like with gangs and then dropped out of the gangs um, it's people who've like flipped on the mob. Um, and then it's like cops and child sex offenders, as far as I can tell. And then obviously like high profile people just in the normal sense of the term. So people like Sam Bacon Freed, um, there was a rapper in there with him whose name I am currently forgetting. Was it Takashi? I don't remember. It was, it was a rapper, um, who was in with him whose name I recognized, which like is a pretty short list, but I can't remember. Um, anyway, like I, I feel like a lot of those people would not be just like super keen on coming out and writing a letter to the judge in this case. Like they probably don't want to raise their own profiles that much. Um, but I, I don't know, maybe, I mean, my understanding is that doing something like that has some benefits to the inmate who writes that letter in the sense that it can you know, influence his own sentence to some extent, I think. Um, but yeah, it, it baffles me a little bit that uh, that they were like, ah, yes, the, the cop child abuser should be the one who writes this letter of support. Someone mentioned he could get a pardon from Biden because they met before and it was contentious. Any input on this? I would be floored if he got a pardon from Biden. Um, there are a lot of sort of conspiracy theories about this case where people believe that um, he's got some sort of like leverage over Democrats or that Democrats are all behind him. Um, it mostly comes out of the fact, I believe, that um, most of the public donations by Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX were supporting Democrats, although broadly speaking, the donations that they made were fairly bipartisan. It was just that they used straw donors for the Republican ones. Um, so I think the narrative that like he's this big Democratic operative and therefore has all of this favors, you know, all these favors he can pull on with the Democrats is pretty flawed. Um but that's largely where I've seen the theory that like, oh, maybe Biden's going to pardon him. Um, and it's also a part of this narrative that's been going around for a long time. That's like Sam Bingman Freed's not going to do any time for his crimes. Like first it was they're not going to charge him. Uh, then it was he was not going to get sentenced or he was not going to get convicted. Of course, now he's convicted. So now it's, oh, he's going to be let off with a light sentence. And then there's also if he's sentenced, he's going to be pardoned by Biden. It's all part of this sort of... Um, theory that like he's going to get away with it um which like i get it i get why people are 
like very reasonably suspicious of the U.S. criminal justice system, especially when it comes to white collar offenses and powerful people. Um, but I do not believe that Biden is going to pardon uh, Sam Bankman fried It would be enormously politically unpopular. I don't think that there would be any real benefits to Biden. Um, I mean, I, I think that, again, maybe some people believe that Bankman fried has just like oodles of cash stashed away somewhere that he would then draw upon and donate to Biden or to Democrats. Um, but I think all of this gets like pretty far into tinfoil hat territory and it doesn't, it just does not seem plausible to me. Aw, thank you to everyone who said happy adoption day to Ruthie. And someone asked about my dog. I don't know where he is. I hope he's not chewing something he's not supposed to be. He's recently gotten back into the habit of stealing, um, like, paper out of the recycling and chewing it up, which is... I don't love that. Am I going to attend the sentencing hearing? No, I am not. Um, I would love to, but I am far enough away from New York that it is a non-trivial amount of travel to get there. Um, and so I will not be there. But I will be getting access to the transcript, um, which is the same thing I did for most of the trial, except for the part where I did attend in person. Um, so I will be able to report a little bit on the... Uh, actual conversations and stuff that happened at trial. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that um, it's really challenging to like live tweet <laughs> uh, a sentencing hearing because they do not allow electronics inside the uh, federal court system uh, unless you are like a very special person who gets you know, who like regularly covers the SDNY and there, then you get access to this like press room and you can have a phone and stuff. Um, so even if I was there, I probably wouldn't be able to give you updates on it any quicker than if I was here. Um, my hope is that um, Inner City Press will live tweet it. Um, he is one of those special few who has been, uh, who's allowed to actually, you know, report live on things from within the courthouse and he has access to devices and stuff. Uh, so hopefully he'll cover it. And then, um, I know the Coinbase reporters are going to be, sorry, not Coinbase, Coindesk reporters are going to be there. Um, Nick Day and, and that group. Um, and during the trial, they had this like fun little relay system set up where, uh, if something interesting happened, one of them would like go outside, get their phone, tweet about it, write up a quick little story for Coindesk, come back inside, and they'd, like, rotate out in that way. Um, so we might get, like, somewhat in real-time updates from Coindesk, but they're going to have to do it in that way because, again, they don't have access to devices. Um... Is he like a for the animals vegan or like an alt-right purity vegan? <laughs> He's a for the animals vegan. Um, he apparently, the story goes that he was like always really into animal rights, especially once he became an effective altruist. Um, and so he became a vegan as a result of that. Uh, they even go into it a little bit in the sentencing memo, but they say like, oh, he used to, when he was a kid, he ate nothing but steak. But then he, because he cared so much about the animals and effective altruism, he went vegan, even though it was so hard for him. Uh, so it's definitely an animal rights thing. Q 
Given all the ways that SPF considered presenting himself, was the media SPF completely a construct? Relatedly, is there an authentic self that constitutes SPF? It's hard to say. I mean, I'm sure to some extent that the media version of Sam Bankman-Fried is inaccurate. I think the media version of anyone is probably inaccurate. Um, but, you know, the, the character reference letters argue that the media version is completely inaccurate and that they've absolutely demonized him and that he's really this very genuine, caring person. Um, they don't really try to address, like, how that squares with the fact that he just did this enormous financial fraud. Um, so, I like, I'd be curious to know how they write, you know, how they sort of... Uh, you know, handle those two things at once in their heads. Um, one Actually, one of the people who wrote a letter about Sam Bankman fried being a vegan sort of showed up in my Twitter mentions not too long ago and has been arguing that uh, Sam Bankman fried basically, it was all a big mistake. He didn't mean to steal all this money. And also, the harm that he's caused pales in comparison to the harm that animals suffer as a result of factory farming and, you know, human eating, humans eating meat and stuff like that, um, which is wild. Um, so I guess that's one data point as to how they managed to keep those two narratives in their heads. But I, I don't know if the others have that those, you know, extreme views about veganism or not, uh, it's hard to say. Yeah, someone mentioned the Silk Road guy. So one thing that I think is interesting is like, after the Silk Road guy, Ross Ulbricht was convicted. Um, and even though his crimes were fairly heinous like he was he wasn't necessarily sentenced on it but he was accused of hiring a hitman at least once um there was still a very strong contingent of people who were like free ross you know and that who believe they they believe he shouldn't have been convicted or that he should have received a much lighter sentence and i'm really curious if that kind of person is going to emerge around sam bankman freed or not um my my sort of gut feeling is probably not because Ross Ulbricht, despite the attempted hits, was pretty popular among especially the more ideological crypto crowd. Um, he was viewed as sort of an ideological purist and someone who truly believed in, you know, like uh, sort of the, the crypto outside of the government control type of narrative and things like that. And so people kind of rallied around that. Whereas, like, there aren't many people in the crypto world who think Sam Bankman frieds a good guy, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Most of them, most of the people who are still on Sam Bankman frieds side seem to come from the effective altruism community, although I think a lot of them have disavowed him as well. Um, and so, um, I mean, I, I I would be surprised to see a free SPF movement, although, I mean, some people some people just like to be contrarian, and so I, I suspect there will be some of that, but I don't know if it's going to be the same um, uh, sort of movement that coalesced around Ross Albrecht. Right. Ross Ulbricht was not convicted on the hitman thing. He was just convicted on the whole Silk Road thing. Um, cool. I think I am caught up with the chat. If anyone wants to throw in uh, last minute questions, now's your chance. Otherwise, I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon and go snuggle my poor suffering cat. <laughs> and also make sure that my dog isn't eating out of the recycling bin. Um, oh, one thing I did mean to look up is what time the sentencing is going to be. Uh, 
I wonder if people are going to line up outside of the courthouse like they did during the trial for the sentencing. I suspect not. I'm guessing there won't be as many reporters there as were there for the um for his testimony, but I I wouldn't be surprised if some of them. Ooh, there's new documents that just came in. Just skimming the documents. So someone, uh, one of the U.S. attorneys just filed a document to reference other court decisions that have to do with how losses are calculated, um, specifically to do with the losses suffered by investors. Um, And it has to do with some details around if that loss amount is calculated based on the decline in the value of the investment, or if it's based on the value of the principal that they put in. So that's really quite fascinating stuff. (laughs) Oh, and it looks like they've put in more victim impact statements, but it's not clear. Those might be the same ones that came in earlier today. Let me just quickly look on Pacer. Sorry for doing this off screen, but it's going to take me 10 minutes to try to (laughs) get it up on a the stream no it looks like they put in more victim impact statements even after the ones that came in um earlier wow they've so they've got like several hundred at this point um doesn't look like anyone has bought those and put them on pacer yet Oh, it's probably because of... Fuck it, I'll buy them. <laughs> um, I just want to see how many there are. Hundred forty five pages long. And we are up to, oh, there's not really a count because they submitted them in a different way. Well, anyway, those are on Pacer now, or they're on Court Listener now if anyone wants to go read them. Um, So. Oh, right. I was trying to figure out what time the sentencing was. (laughs) I just got very distracted by that. Is it? 9.30. So nice and early, but not painfully early. Um, Yeah, so sentencing starts at 9.30, and then we'll see how long it goes. Uh, I've heard varying estimates of how long it will go. Some people think it will be really quick, and that Judge Kaplan has basically made up his mind already, and that he doesn't want to hear, like, a long protracted argument over the same stuff that's already been submitted in writing, but um, others think it's going to be several hours long. Oftentimes, victims will actually come and make statements in person, and so obviously there will be time uh, allocated to that. Um, So it could be midday, maybe later in the day. I haven't heard anyone predicting that it would take multiple days, but I mean, I don't think there's any reason it couldn't. Has anyone heard from Sam Trabuco recently? No, I don't believe so. (laughs) He's still, I was going to say in the wind, but he's more somewhere at sea as far as I've last heard. Will I do another stream discussing the sentencing once it comes out? I might, yeah. Um, Like I said, I should get access to the transcript pretty quickly. Usually it's like the end of the day. Um, And so once I've had an opportunity to read that, uh, I might do a stream. I'm, I will definitely write about it at some point, but I might do a stream too. What level of sentencing do I think is fair? That's a good question. I mean, I have some sympathy for the arguments that like long sentences in the like 40 to 50 year range 
don't really achieve much more than the like 20 year sentence. And I will say it does feel uh, a little weird to see like the DOJ saying, oh, he's he's so likely to reoffend um, without a ton of evidence other than just like he's an effective altruist. Um, and so I don't necessarily find their argument that like he has to be in prison to prevent him from reoffending. I don't find that super compelling. Like I feel and I feel like if they're really worried about him reoffending, there are other ways to try to prevent that from happening. Like, you know, um various uh outcomes where people are prevented from being like the CEO of a company or they're prevented from working in a lot of it's like you can't work in securities the securities industry. Those those tend to be the outcomes of like SEC cases. Um and so like it seems like there could be something there where they could find a non-custodial punishment that would achieve largely the same effect. Um you know, I <laughs> Regardless of the harm that Bankman Freed and, and many criminals have perpetrated, I mean, decades and decades in prison is a pretty brutal uh, thing to face. And I, I feel for people who are facing that. Um, so, you know, I think a significant sentence is reasonable, but something like 20 years might be, uh, you know, sort of what I would um, hope to see. Uh, but... I mean, we'll see, I guess. Um, but, you know, I think I think that is very influenced by my sort of opinions on the criminal justice system in general. And I would like to see those, you know, changes to the criminal justice system applied very broadly, not just to Sam Bankman Freed. Um, so, you know, it, it feels a little weird to say, I think you should get a 20 year sentence when other people in his shoes would get a much longer one. Um I would like to see sort of the whole thing changed and Sam Bankman Fried's sentence reflect that rather than, you know, a one off uh, lighter sentence for Bankman Fried. What is the difference between SBF and Ross? Uh, I'm not sure it's sort of what you're asking there. I mean, the, the crimes were very different. So Ross was operating the Silk Road, which was like a dark web mostly drug marketplace, although you could get guns and hitmen and all sorts of things on there. Um, and so to some extent, his conviction was seen, or I guess his crimes were seen as like less harmful by some people who think that, you know, it's actually kind of fine if you're buying weed online, um, which is a lot of what was happening on the Silk Road back then when it was, because, you know, this was before a lot of states legalized marijuana. Um, obviously there were also harder drugs and all sorts of other things happening on that site, but a lot of it was that like weed and shrooms. And a lot of people don't get too upset about the idea of buying weed and shrooms illegally. And they don't think that a huge sentence is justified. Um, the, the hitman thing was obviously a bit of a fly in that ointment. Um, although because he wasn't ultimately convicted on the hitman uh, charges, you know, I think people say he shouldn't be being punished for them either. Um, and that's actually something that comes up in this case as well, now that I think of it, is um, the government brings up the Chinese officials that Bankman Freed reportedly bribed uh, with like over $100 million, I think, um, and also the political donations as factors that should impact the sentence, uh, which they're allowed to do, even though he wasn't, the the jury did not render a verdict on those things because those charges were split from the first trial. Uh, some of you might remember that there were supposed to be two trials and the government ultimately decided to ditch the second one, um, partly because they the judge is allowed to consider those chart or the evidence supporting those uh, charges when determining a sentence. Um, and I think there's like kind of a reasonable conversation to be had there around if that should be allowed, because like it feels pretty wild that a judge can, you know, could say, well, I think he's guilty of this political finance crime and therefore I'm going to give him this harsh sentence when the jury hasn't actually rendered a verdict on that. So um, there's some similarity in that sense. But 
going back to the original question, I think Ross Ulbricht was somewhat sympathetic just in terms of the nature of the crime. Um, and, you know, people, the sort of like libertarian side of things where it's like he should be, people should be able to buy whatever they want online um, and use crypto to do it because, you know, the MasterCard won't let you go buy weed online. Um, and so, you know, some people really rallied around him and sort of turned him into this sort of martyr figure, um, which I don't necessarily think will happen with Sam Bankman fried given that so many people feel uh, that he harmed them, they, he harmed the reputation of the crypto industry, so on and so forth. Does Judge Kaplan have a history of following the DOJ's recommendations for sentencing? I don't know. That's a very good question. I would love to know the answer to. <laughs> Where's Miss Race Science Tumblr account in all of this right now? Uh, so for those who are not familiar, that refers to Caroline Ellison. Um, she has not been sentenced yet. And in fact, none of the other four who have been convicted, uh, the, the other four uh, co-conspirators who've been convicted have been sentenced yet. Um, I don't even think their sentencing has been scheduled yet, um, but I, I'm not sure on that. Um, I'm really curious to see how that sentencing will go, though. I love the comments about your friend who wanted to send in a victim impact statement about receiving an FTX ad in his fortune cookie. I think getting an ad in your fortune cookie would be so upsetting. Like, like I want a fortune. I don't want an ad. Ugh. Certainly not the worst thing that FTX has done, but like, oh, just give him a fortune. No victim impact statements from Ashton and Mila Kunis, no. They're too busy, I think, dealing with their own crypto case, which is, I think, from the SEC. Having to buy U.S. court documents is the most bullshit thing, especially in a digital era. What a fucking racket. Fully agree with you on that. Pacer should be free. What is my personal engagement? Did I lose on FTX? No, I did not have uh, any money on FTX, largely because I don't hold cryptocurrency beyond a very small amount for research. Um, so yeah, I'm not a I'm not a crypto person. I uh, don't buy crypto. I don't have personal engagement besides the fact that. Um, you know, I, I hate seeing people get scammed and I speak out about crypto a lot and FTX is a pretty brutal example of how things can go wrong in the crypto world. How can you find the confidential document on Court Listener? Um, yeah, so despite the confidential thing, it's, it's public. Um, it's a public document because it's been filed, unsealed. Um, it's that one is a part of, I'll throw the link in there to the docket. That's the docket link. And then the, um, it's a part of docket entry 410. Um, I forget if it's exhibit B, C, or D, but you should see the opportunity to view those attachments. It's one of those. Do I think Bankman Freed has funds, coins, money, or property of any kind squirreled away? Maybe some. I don't really buy the theory that he has tons and tons of it. Like some people are like, he's got billions, you know, in crypto wallets somewhere, which like maybe, but it kind of seems unlikely to me, especially with the, um, you know, the bankruptcy teams combing through this, the DOJ is combing through this, several other agencies are combing through this for civil cases. Um, so he would have had to hide it pretty well. And I don't feel like he was really covering his tracks that much beyond like, uh, 
hoping that people didn't read his Google Docs. So I don't know if I buy that he was like anticipating this big uh, law enforcement action and, you know, made contingency plans. But who knows? Maybe he did. Do, 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 do. The most unfortunate fortune cookie. I think unfortunate cookie is a good idea. Okay with document fees if and only if they go directly to the steno. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a good argument for fees to pay for stenographers, but... I don't think PACER and the PACER model is really the right uh, way to achieve that. All right, I have caught up with the chat. So I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, oh, wait, there's a PACER comment. I can't, PACER is like catnip for me. I can't resist a PACER comment. Um, so documents are capped at $3 max each, which is why it's usually 10 cents a page. And I just bought a, a document that was like 145 pages long, but I didn't have to pay 10 cents a page because it cuts off at $3, which is great. Um, but that's still not free. Uh, and uh, there's also, they also have a good um, sort of system where uh, if you don't, hit a certain amount in PACER fees. Like if you only buy a couple of documents in a quarter and it's below the cutoff, then they just say, don't even bother. Um, but it's still not free. And I've definitely paid a couple hundred bucks in PACER fees over my time uh, writing about crypto, which is like, it shouldn't, people shouldn't have to. They're public records. Uh, and I think it's really important that people are able to access public records. Um, that's partly why I like the Court Listener Project so much. I'm usually shilling it in some way or another. Um, so if you ever, like, little plug here, if you ever, ever, ever buy a PACER document or you think you might in some future case do so, make sure you download a browser extension called Recap, which automatically... Um, if you purchase a PACER document and no one else has done so already, it will take that document that you've downloaded and upload it to Court Listener, which is where I get most of these court documents for free because the first person who downloads it, usually a journalist or someone who's interested in the case, um, will then upload it to Court Listener so it's free for everybody else, which goes a long way in helping people access um, these public documents. Obviously, the best solution would be to have them be properly free, but having, you know, this system is is considerably better. So get recap. What do I think was Sam Bankman frieds end plan? Do you think he honestly thought he could sort it all? I mean, <laughs> I don't know how much there was an end plan, but I think he genuinely did think he could get away with it and that he was just making these big bets. But I and that and that like, you know, as crypto prices continued to go up forever or whatever, um, it would all just work out. But I also sort of wonder, like, his behavior as described in various testimonies, um, it seems like he just was sort of constantly making bigger and bigger and bigger bets, where there was a point where he started to ask, he, like, asked Caroline Ellison to do some calculations on, like, the pros and cons of him making several, I think, billion dollars more in venture investments, even when uh, FTX was in a pretty rough situation financially. Um, and so and, and she said, basically, no, that's a bad idea. You know, it's too much risk that if crypto markets take a turn for the worse, um, you know, we could end up insolvent basically and and he was like okay thanks for your feedback and then went and made the investments anyway uh so it seems like you know i i don't really believe necessarily that like oh once he you know once these investments all shake out then he's going to stop and start 
acting like he was, you know, supposed to be doing and, and just responsibly custodying funds um, because it seems like he was kind of a gambler who would just sort of keep making bigger and bigger and bigger bets. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think I mean, I think probably in his head, the end game was that, you know, crypto prices would go up, assets would appreciate in value and all of this so-called borrowed money wouldn't really be taken out of the customer pool and that it would all just be from FTX's profits eventually. But um, I don't think that's likely to be how it would have played out, even if FTX hadn't collapsed in November 2022. I think it probably would have happened eventually. Yeah, there is a settlement regarding fees. Um, I don't, I also don't know what percentage people would be getting back. And I do think that's wonderful. Um, but unfortunately it hasn't changed anything going forward. So people still have to pay pacer fees and I guess like could potentially sue again over the same thing, uh, and achieve a settlement again, but it just seems like a really bad way of doing it. Like, okay, so we've acknowledged that the pacer fees are inappropriate, we're going to give you your money back, but we're going to keep charging the fees. It just seems kind of insane. All right. I have caught up with the chat. Thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. This is super fun. Um, I will hopefully do another one after the uh, sentence is announced tomorrow. Um, I'll also be writing about it. So if you, you know, subscribe to my newsletter, you'll see it there too. Um, but I think it would be interesting to go over the transcript and just sort of the um, events that happened yesterday because I'm not going to write out everything that happened in the newsletter. Um, so it'll depend a little bit on what time I get that transcript and then how long it is and how long it takes me to read it. Uh, I'm a pretty quick reader, but if it's super long uh, or if I get it super late, then it might be, this might be a Friday thing. Um, so catch you later. <laughs>